I'm Connie Moser, and I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Knights at the Round Table. My guest tonight is Jeremy McPike. He's the candidate for the 31st District, and welcome, Jeremy. Thank, Thank you, you for coming. Thank you, Connie. Thanks for having me. Good. I'm, uh, we're already friends, so I'm not going to pretend like we don't know each other, but I would like for you to tell me a little bit about yourself, if you don't mind, so they can learn about you. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, I grew up uh, in Prince William in the Dale City area. I've been here for 37 years, and uh, and you know, I've been involved in the community and uh, been a volunteer fireman uh, for Dale City for the last 15 years. And uh, we live here with uh, my wife and three girls. And, uh, and professionally, I uh, serve as the Director of General Services for the City of Alexandria. So I've been involved in local government, both in, in the community as a volunteer as well as professionally and, mm -hmm. uh, in construction, managing uh, municipal projects uh, over the last decade. So that must have served you well because I know that you um, were um, instrumental in creating the first, are you gold certified leads? That's right. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, fire For station, the fire station? Mm -hmm. Fire station 10 on Dale Boulevard uh, is the first lead gold uh, volunteer fire station on the East Coast uh -huh. and, um, and the first uh, municipal building in Prince William to have that designation. And so in Alexandria I've worked on many different sustainability and uh, energy efficiency projects over the last decade and it's been a great uh, experience helps by reducing obviously energy consumption and uh -huh. cost avoidance and uh, it's certainly been helpful during the recession when uh, you know, budgets have been getting tighter mm -hmm. to also be able to tight up, tighten up some of the costs of uh, operating buildings. Well I, I work with a lot of citizens committees and I have a pretty good working knowledge of environment and, it, and it's something we really push when we have a courtesy review we really try to get people interested in green technology, um, maybe using cisterns instead of catchments and um, uh, stormwater ponds. Drainage is always a big thing. Runoff is always a big thing. So it's really good to know that you thought of those and incorporated those. I mean, you're a shining example of what can be done. Well, it, it is great. And it's also great when we have at the fire station, you know, tours with Girl Scouts and other youth to see that the materials are made from recycled mm -hmm. materials. Uh, the, the fire station does have a cistern that collects the water off the roof mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know really the overall sort of whole building performance that was key and, and frankly for firefighters you know it's important to have good indoor air quality so that was really sure. one of the major factors in making some of the decisions we did for that project. Mm -hmm. um, you know we expose ourselves to a lot of hazards in the business and uh, you know you shouldn't have those hazards when you come back. Right. And so we also looked at our cleaning project, pro uh, product, excuse me, uh -huh. and um, it made sure that those were, we weren't introducing harmful chemicals in the fire station by cleaning. And so we really looked you know, top to bottom on how we could improve uh, our environment. Well, I don't want to keep you on that particular topic sure. because I do have some other things I want to talk to you about. And the f for foremost in my mind is I saw that you made a post on, because we're Facebook friends, we're, I'm Facebook friends with everybody, and uh, I saw that you made a post the other day about an abusive situation, and I, I was intrigued that you took the time to make a comment about that personally, so I know that it must have affected you. Yeah, we had uh, an incident where we actually had someone come to the fire station um, early one morning, I think it was 1 or 2 a.m., and um, you know, she had just been beaten by mm. um, you know, her, her spouse and had a kid involved, and those are very complex situations. You get to see a lot of different life stories in the fire service, and you know, from a legislative perspective, um, we need to find out ways to help people that are trapped in abusive situations. And that's really key is, is looking at opportunities to do that. There's some legislation this year mm -hmm. that would have helped and freed uh, people who are in leases to help terminate it early. We have a documented case of spousal abuse. And there's many, many situations of that. In the fire service, unfortunately, you, you get to see everything. Mm -hmm. um, and I've certainly seen a lot over the last 15 years in the community. And, um, and That it's seems so logical. I mean, it doesn't seem like something you would actually have to legislate, but it is. It, it is because they've got a, they've entered into a contract and they're locked into to that term of the contract. And so, when you're financially strapped, mm -hmm. it really limits uh, your opportunities to uh, make other life choices and get away from that abu abusal uh, scenario. So, mm -hmm. we actually have a. a um, I'm not sure what it's called. It's like a group home. It's for battered women yeah. in our neighborhood, and it's that's yeah. a pretty common scenario. I mean, there, there's more. I think more houses like that than people realize. Yeah. Um, it's still a common situation, and still not talked about a lot. 
It, it is tough, and it, it gets to the financial. It, it, you know, a lot of folks feel trapped because of the financial mm -hmm. situations they find themselves in. And uh, the more we can offer up those services that give them the next opportunity to make the choice, it's already mm -hmm. tough enough sure. to divorce yourself of the emotions involved in those situations, but really to find safety to make good choices and out of that dangerous situation. Mm -hmm. And the tough thing is a lot of times there's kids involved. And um, you know, kids being brought up in that environment is such a, a tough, tough thing to see. But uh, the more we can do to, to bring some better options to the table, mm -hmm. you know, we really need to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to hear you say that. Um, also, I think foremost in everybody's mind, particularly this week, is the uh, north-south uh, corridor, the, the discussion about the tri-county or the bi-county parkway. I know transportation is something that you are interested in. Your platform is geared toward better transportation solutions. I wonder if you could give me an opinion um, on that particular corridor. We, we seem to be reaching a, a strange stage of business people appear to be in favor of it while regular ordinary citizens are opposed. Does that um, resonate with you some way or? Well, the, I think the, the biggest thing that's on the table right now is we have a lot of existing bottlenecks that yes. we've all experienced day in and day out for decades. And guess what? They start at the Prince William County line. Mm -hmm. you know, we hit the Occoquan River Bridge on 95, we hit Manassas in 66, and we have existing issues that really need to be addressed and put forward first. Mm -hmm. And that needs to be our priority. I mean, intuitively, we know where they are, because guess what? Those areas make us late to soccer practice, to yeah. picking up our kids at dance, and all these other things. And those are the things that are really are impacting our quality of life. I have some concerns on sort of widening 234 to six lanes in some of the areas. We have communities really close to mm -hmm. a lot of those areas through Montclair and, and Dumfries and Ashland mm -hmm. within the 31st district. and. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely a concern. We need to be forward looking, but we also need to take care of the things we have on the table right now. Right. I th um, what about public transportation? Because that's a, I, I, between telework and public transportation, we could ease all that other congestion if we yeah. could just get something going there. I think one, one of the keys that, you know, we've, we've seen in Prince William struggle with is sort of the balance of the commercial tax base to the residential tax base. And we look at opportunities like the FBI Academy yeah. and other things. And if you're going to land, you know, a, a really, you know, base, either government agency or business, you've got to start to look at transit options and a way to move people. Mm -hmm. um, that's the only way we're going to be able to attract. And we've got some great assets, both in the, the technology park as well as uh, in George Mason, as well as at Quantico, and some natural hubs to work from. Mm -hmm. But until you start to be able to really move people to the jobs, in and out, we're going to be limited into those opportunities. And I was happy to see that uh, you know Congressman Connolly put forward a bill to start to study the metro to Woodbridge, mm -hmm. and so we've got to look at the long term on how to look at right of ways and other options to begin to build how we're going to provide real transit options to the area mm -hmm. as well as to Gainesville, and so both of those things are going to be key to when, in a whole picture. When I moved here 28 years ago we were talking about bringing Metro to Woodbridge then. And had we actually started then, it might be almost completed today. So my thinking is that we're a little late to be thinking about Metro. Yeah. That 30 years from now, it may be totally obsolete. It, I, I brought this topic up at a chamber meeting and, a, and a, one fellow laughed out loud because I said, you know, cars will drive themselves soon. And he thought that was hilarious. Of course, he owns a cab company. So <laughs> maybe, maybe he just didn't want to focus on that. But I just read yesterday, you know, the Google car has 300,000 miles on it. And it's, been, it's automatic driving. No, there is no driver. It's been driving itself for 300,000 miles. So it's obviously here. It's just too expensive to instigate. But 30 years from now, I mean, who, you know, is Metro still going to be the answer? Well, you know, certainly, uh, you know, we'll, we'll always reassess as technology changes and uh, you know, figure out the new gadgets as they come. But um, Well, I think that's the objection, though, is people don't want to invest that vast, because a study is an enormous expenditure, just the study is expensive. Mm -hmm. And usually by the time the study is complete, it's obsolete because everything has changed. And no matter, I, I'm sure people tried to predict what our population would be 
28 years ago, but I'm sure I never heard the number 430,000. There's just no, really, there's no predicting. So I think people are reluctant to commit that kind of funding mm -hmm. to something that's not a sure bet. Um, do, are you interested in light rail at all? Does that? Well, we got we got to look at, at some of the options of connectivity and and assess the cost. But the the basics are until you start to solve the solution, we're going to be in a, a stuck in a di in a really tough situation um, in the area. And one one of the problems is we now see expansion going out to area in terms of metro mm -hmm. that we know we've been built out in a lot of areas that have needed metro for 30 right. years. And so that's one of, the, one of the problems is sort of the priority in picking water. Um, frankly, the, this area seems to be very low and continues to be low mm -hmm. in the priority. And it, you know, it's time we have a voice that starts to focus in on that and really start to prioritize well, how we get there. It's something that concerns me is that the, the, the limited amount of land that we do have mm -hmm. that would be feasible for um, class A type buildings mm -hmm. where, where perhaps large government contractors or any large government business would want to locate, those spaces are becoming filled up rapidly. And a good example um, is the Caton Hill area. Mm -hmm. that, that's one of the few remaining large tracts of land. It's a big tract of land. And now there's, you know, there's talk of construction there. And they want it to be residential plus office space. And, uh, and I do agree. One of the arguments for that is that it's obviously been designated wrong because no one has invested in it in all these years. But there's some little part of me that says, but if you do that, Th that's one of the only big tracts of land that's accessible mm -hmm. right next to Horner Road. You know, we could conceivably have business there. And if you start on it now, what, you know, I, it's hard to say. You don't want to discourage developers. You want them to be able to make money on their property. That's what they bought it for. But it seems like, especially when we were talking earlier about the Bi-County, Tri-County Parkway, if we keep carving up the little bit of land that's left and designating it for houses, there's not going to be any place to put business even if we do get transportation. All we'll be able to do is what we're doing now. We'll be able to move people to somewhere else. And when they go somewhere else, they're spending their money somewhere else. They're not spending right. their money here. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the long-range planning and, and land use discussions are always you know, difficult when you're trying to project for something that's not there yet. And you mm -hmm. look at sort of small area plans, but what has worked well in many areas is planning around those transportation nodes. And so whether it's a metro or light rail or other options, is to figure out ways to leverage those opportunities mm -hmm. and look at how it's zoned, what opportunities are there are for some commercial office and class A office. And, uh, you know, you, set, you help set the stage with those discussions from a community standpoint on what you want to see. And that'll help to drive the discussion and, and also generate some of the interest uh, from the development standpoint. Well, I'm willing to discuss that with just about anybody that'll listen to me. <laughs> so, well, and it's, it's, it's an important struggle that you know many communities have. We're, we are no different, and um, you know we're still a growing area. And right. So it's really critical that we start to uh, you know look at ways to make investments to help grow jobs and you know help draw some of that base and hopefully reduce some of those commuting hours too getting jobs closer, expanding some of the telecommuting opportunities and other things. Well, if sequestration doesn't start moving itself along, that's not going to be a big problem for yeah. us either. That has really been a bitter pill to swallow. Um, my husband's been out of work since February, the end of February now. Yeah. So that's a long time. I've, I've met a lot of people over the last few months that are impacted or know someone impacted. Our producer, Bill, hit, has taken a huge hit in his business because yeah. it's all about government contracting and Yep. and getting jobs and no one is hiring everybody's ho everybody is hold off let's wait let's see and the hard part about that is it's such a minuscule amount the reduction is just to, it just really slows the pace of debt accrual it's yeah. not really fixing it right i mean i I wouldn't mind sacrificing so much if we knew we were fixing it but it's it's not well, it, 
you know, OMB was, you know, just asking for additional cuts for the next fiscal cycle. And so, you know, this is really just the first round. Mm -hmm. And so there are a lot more discussions to come that are going to impact this area, unfortunately. And, um, you know, it's time to, to use the opportunity to, to hopefully figure out how to, to retool and continue to build jobs not as dependent on the federal government. And that's a tough thing to say sure. here. That's a really tough thing here. But the advantage is you've got a tremendously talented workforce here. And to draw on companies that, that need that resource um, is a good opportunity. Right. You've got one of the highest educated workforces in America right here. And um, that's a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully we can you know, help to push that message and um, you know, also expand the telework opportunities and uh, you know, hopefully weather through some of the sequestration. You know, this is sort of the first wave, and mm -hmm. unfortunately, there's likely more coming. Thanks, I feel so much better. <laughs> we we try. feel so much better now. <laughs> I think maybe it, us. It, it's, a tough, it, it's tough. It is. I, I've met a lot of people over the last couple of yeah. months that, that are worried. They, they are slowing down some of their spending, but um, there's a lot of talent too, and that's a good thing. Well, it's the, I know we actually discussed this uh, uh, not too long ago. It, it's the trickle-down effect that really is going to be felt next. It's the people that, you know, uh, hairdressers and lawn maintenance people and right. people that wash your car, service people, who are already just barely getting by. They're yeah. just barely making it. And now th those services, those are going to be the first things that people who are furloughed that one day a week, they're going to say, well, you know what, I could wash my own car, I can mow my own grass. And those are the people that are really going to be affected. Yep. It, th that's right. It, it is going to affect, but I, I think everyone understands that the government's got to make choices. And I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that they're ma being made the right way by any means, because mm -hmm. I think to do paint a brush that uh, across the board cuts are the right way is absurd. Right, I you, agree. You, you, have to, you have to ask the questions. What, it, what is the government doing? Mm -hmm. What should it be doing? And then, if does it work? Doesn't it work? Should it be fixed? Should you be right. doing it at all? Right. And right now, the broad brush is to you know, paint everyone of uh, you know, the same sort of cut. Well, that's not making choice. That's not leadership. Mm -hmm. And I think both you know, Democrats and Republicans are a part, of, part to blame. You have to ask the questions. And I think you, you've seen local government doing it during their sessions. I think there's a lot more to be mm -hmm. done there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, professionally, I've certainly had to do that over the last decade. My staff has gone from 81 down to 66. Wow. Um, and it's about helping to align what you're supposed to be doing with the resources you have. Mm -hmm. And once you get down to the bottom of the list, if it's not as a high priority, you need to do something different. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to continue to have that discussion throughout local, state, and federal government. And you know, people, as their pocketbook book tightens up, the same has got to go for what we do and how sure. we do it. And that's a tough balance. Um, it really is. But um, you know, I, it, it's impacting right now, as, as you said, you know, probably the wrong areas. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, that, that's not the right way to do you it. You can't say, though, you know, I, when, we, when we talk about this with people, they're apt to say something like, well, well you know, well, they should cut all those airplanes. They don't need all those airplanes. Or they should stop building all those ships. We don't need all those ships. But those are jobs. It's, you're not cutting away just a piece of machinery. That piece of machinery has generated jobs from the highest level to the lowest. And yeah. so when you just say cut, any cut's going to impact people somewhere. Yeah. Um, we're not, this area is not going to be immune to it. Um, so we're going to have to share the pain, unfortunately, because it, whether it's in, you know, all 50 states have federal workers. And, um, you know, it, it does have to go back to the prioritization. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's going to be a, a tough, tough thing to do. But it involves honest discussion. And I think that's the key. I'm not sure, you know, the defense cuts are the right area. Uh, and certainly in, the, in this area, um, you know, anyone has, I, I have family in the, you know, sure. who's been in the military, everyone has, um, and understand th their sacrifices and good work, um, you know, protecting, uh, you know, our freedoms. But um, we've got to ask the questions. And, uh, well, this is, a, this is kind of a touchy subject because uh, when you raise the, the ugly head of benefits, everybody kind of freaks out, it's particularly, but we're a retired military, we're 20 years in the military. 
and we never used our medical benefits in right. all of that time because we could afford our own insurance. We could afford it through Bill's company, and we always paid premiums, and we've never used on the base in all these years. So now, here we are with no job, and he's 62, and we are using our medical benefits, our Champus, for the very first time. And so the part of me is the part that never used those benefits because we didn't have to. Now I'm thinking, well, what would we do if we didn't have those? Mm. Because if we didn't have those, wouldn't we become dependent upon some other form of government to cover our medical expenses? There's right. just no, it's just a big round circle, if you ask me. You, you may cut this, but then you will have to make it up somewhere else. Well, cer certainly the entitlement discussion is a huge discussion, uh, and more specifically the, the health care, the Medicaid, um, and certainly with health care changes coming, there's lots of questions mm. on the table right now in the marketplace um, that um, I think if anyone cl claims to be a, an expert right now, I'd be suspect because I think the marketplace is moving so fast right now and trying to adjust that um, I think the, the market's really starting to shake out to figure out how shifts are happening in employment, both in healthcare and other means. So um, th there's more to come on that without a doubt. Mm. There's definitely more to come on the entitlements as well as the changes in healthcare. But you are capable, I, I know you to be capable of working across the aisle. You can work with Democrats or Republicans. And to me, that's important. It, I, I am an independent voter. I don't care whether you're Republican or Democrat, I care that you can do the job for us. And, and I think there are far more people like me out there yeah. than anyone realizes. But there yeah. are still you know, people who are straight party voters yep. and don't mess with their ideology. You have to toe that party line. Um, so I hope that having discussions like this and understanding that it's nobody's out to punish anyone or, or pick a particular class of people, we're seeking a solution, and everybody mm -hmm. has to get involved. Yeah, and I think there's a, you know, really a strong feeling out there of really pragmatic solutions. People want problem solving, not ideology, mm -hmm. um, and that's a, a consistent undercurrent when I when I talk to people um, out in the community. They want to ask the questions. They want to roll up sleeves, and it doesn't matter whether it's a Democrat yeah. or Republican. Um, it's about, you know, trying to problem solve be honest about it, put it on the table, mm -hmm. and figure it out. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, if you do that, I think people understand and respect it. But the, the other part of it is also having the leadership and our politicians to have the discussions. Right. And you know, sometimes folks shy away from having those discussions. Lay it out, what's the information? And part of, part of I think, being a representative is educating. It's not... Mm -hmm it's to provide the information and to provide a forum for dialogue. And that's important. That's sure. important that people build context for what are the issues and how do you solve them. Well, I think you'd be good at that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, I do want to ask you one more thing. I, 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 um, I missed my opportunity to segue into um, housing. I, I know recently um, VOICE, which is, um, I don't know what the acronym stands for, but I know who they are. They're a conglomeration mm -hmm. of um, religious leaders. Yeah. Virginians and organized for interfaith. Thanks. Community and yeah. I should have looked that yep, up. Yep. Yeah. Now you look really much smarter than me. <laughs> you, you know, you just forgot it. It's all right. <laughs> um, but they have recently obtained a, a huge sum of money as a, um, I think as a sort of a side effect of um, the banking crisis that uh, the foreclosure money and there was so much uh, turmoil from that and people are still feeling that so yeah. um, can you explain just a little because you obviously you know I've just got the tip of the iceberg here don't I <laughs> well the yeah voice is a an interfaith group of Virginians that came together to help solve you know some of um, the crisis in the community which is still going on there's still obviously foreclosures that occur people are struggling to still m make ends meet mm -hmm. and and you know, priests and uh, clergy were seeing this and they came together and said, hey, we've got to come to the table to find out some solutions here. Mm -hmm. And so they did some outreach to 
the biggest thing is getting the housing counselors to the table and getting them help on how do you manage through the process where you're in tight times. And the other thing is they have also got some money to help buy some of the foreclosures and get families back into them. And that's critical. You know, it's critical to help slow down and help those families sure. when they really need it. And the great thing is it was community-based. You know, it was not government, mm -hmm. but a community came together. They reached out to Senator Mark Warner. And of course, Mark came back and said, give me your business plan as a you know, very business-minded uh -huh. um, you know, senator. And they did. You know, they came back and they put together an expert team that you know, really put thought through the financials. And they're doing it with the help of uh, Virginia Housing Authority, VHDA. They came to the table with, uh, I believe, 15 million and uh, have been a great partner now between the community and uh, you know, the state government as well as uh, the banking industry. And mm -hmm. that, that's where you see the really positive things in the community, where, where uh, they're able to put together those three elements to really make it work. Um, you know, I, we did s some work in the fire service. I helped establish a, uh, in 2009 a down payment program to help firefighters stay in the community and oh. volunteer. And um, you know, those things to help get roots and get established um, and help get some of those foreclosure uh, homes off the market is helps everyone's bottom line. See, and, I don't and it helps to the, helps to the refinance. We got a lot of families still looking to oh, refinance absolutely. that are right on the bubble. And, and unless we continue to keep the eye on this and help stabilize and keep that growth and the value of the homes, we're going to be floating for a while. And many people are just within a few percentage points of being able to refinance. You're going to free up a lot of cash mm -hmm. flow and people's ability to make their bills and maybe spend a little money. Right. More money. Their payments will be lower. Payments will be lower. And so there's a lot of liquidity that's locked up right now mm -hmm. that um, hopefully in the next year we'll, we'll be able to uh, free some up and uh, help the market out. I don't think people realize because we we tout our reputation as the seventh wealthiest county in the United yeah. States. I don't think people realize that there are firemen who can't afford to live in Prince William County. That's and right. there are policemen and there are teachers. There are a lot of people who live, who, who work here who cannot afford to live here. That's right. Yeah, a lot of teachers, police and firemen live and commute an hour to Prince William mm -hmm. um, for affordability reasons. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's important when you have people who serve the community to be connected and living and engaged in the community. I think that's ideal um, when possible. And uh, opening, up the, uh, opening up those opportunities are, are important. Well, tell me, is there anything that I, that I didn't cover that you would like to in our? Well, you know, Connie, I'm running for the Virginia House of Delegates mm -hmm. in the 31st District. And you know, it's always a tough, dis you know, tough decision, number one. You know, I've been involved in public service you know, for yeah. some time, and uh, both, you know, in volunteering as well as uh, professionally, and to sort of change that dynamic and sort of put myself out there publicly was a tough family choice. But, uh, you know, my wife and three girls were great. We, you know, we sat down and the three girls sat on the couch and, uh, you know, said, you know, I'm thinking about running for, for public office. And they all sort of looked at each other and they, they quickly raised their hands. <laughs> and they said, can we be in the 4th of July parade? <laughs> so, you know, it's all about the key things. Perspective. This perspective. Yeah. So <laughs> they're, they're ready for, to do some waving in the 4th of July parade. And they're excited. They've been great. We've been uh, doing an event to try to make it fun. And I think that's the important thing is, you know, some of the discussion, I think people get so wrapped up in it, but they're important issues. But we also have to make it engaging and fun because there's uh -huh. too many people that are disengaged with the process but there's so many important decisions. We've got to find a better way to have dialogue on issues um, without creating these sort of ideological extremes in the process. Exactly. You know, identify the problem, talk about solutions, let's roll the sleeves together. A lot of times, you know, we have very common strategies, but we argue and bicker over the tactics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, the same goal, a lot of times the same goal in mind. So. But you know we're trying to we're having fun with it. It's been great. We've picked up a lot of stories um, from people um, at doors, on the streets, at events, and um, th it's important. It's important we have a voice that you know connects with people, with the issues, feel it. You know, from I commute an hour each day. You know, I uh -huh. certainly feel the transit and transportation issues. You know, with my three girls in school, you know, I certainly 
have an interest in the outcomes in our, our school system. Uh -huh. And um, you know, professionally, I've seen sort of the state to local tension. And um, you know, in managing budgets, you know, the state, frankly, has passed a lot of costs down to localities sure. during the recession. And that, that's, that's been tough. Um, the state has its responsibilities and I think should own those responsibilities and mm -hmm. costs. And um, sort of balancing the, bo the books on the back of the localities I don't think is the right approach. Well, I think it's because they don't realize they're not really just balancing it on the localities. In as particularly Prince William County, you're balancing it on homeowners that's because right. we it, don't have that business base. It, and it passes through. That's it, right. It passes right through, and that's why you see the Board of County Supervisors across the area have to increase taxes. Mm -hmm. there, there are pass-throughs, and I know everyone tries to balance and do the best they can. Just a tough, tough decision, but yeah. the, the state owns, owns that. And it's always interesting to see the, the sort of federal, the state, the state always complains about the federal unfunded mandates, but the state then does it to localities. And so I think we need to have a little bit better um, um, well, eye, eye on some of those issues. To be honest though, citizens too, I, citizens demand their services. They want their roads plowed, they want their streets mm -hmm. swept, they want their whatever. They want those services, but you have to pay for those. They don't just come, you can't keep increasing the load and never increasing the tax to pay for them. I, I'm probably one of those, this is a good thing you're not a Republican because this probably wouldn't set well, but I am perfectly all right with an increase in taxes if it means a, a benefit to our community. Yeah. If it's something, I, I would rather pay more taxes than see more cuts made to our core services and to our teachers and our schools. I think it's more important I, I did until February anyway, I think it was better to pay more taxes in, than to continue to cut those services. So that's from an independent point of view. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think we, we, we owe it to the system and the process to ask the questions. Whether it's a tax decrease or increase, what mm -hmm. are we trying to achieve? Mm -hmm. And I think once we go through that and prioritize, you know, maybe it's a decrease. Um, maybe it is an increase for some special things. I mean, I like to see if you're going to do something like that. Hopefully, it's a fee-based service, so you know directly what right. you're getting. Um, which the you know our gas tax, which was just revised, um, used to be a, a sort of user fee. Mm -hmm. In other words, you you buy gas and it helps pay for roads. That that's going away now, and so there's only small small portions now. Our sales tax is growing up now. It's sort of blended, so we can't really tell anymore sure. what we're getting. Um, it's my preference that we, we try to do user base so you know what you're getting and you can sort of directly and there can't be sort of shifts and cooking the books later on. Uh -huh. um, you know, we, we certainly have to ask the questions and you know, back to the transportation piece, in fact, the, cha this, the change in the sales tax. One of the things I worry about is, you know, how is Northern Virginia with the new increased tax in the area also not going to be impacted by the new revenues offsetting downstate? In other words, are we going to still only get 40 cents on the dollar mm -hmm. for what we send to Richmond? And that's a huge, huge number that we don't Absolutely. get back. Absolutely. And so now with the new tax, those are sort of additional shifts that are going to occur that mm -hmm. get cooked off the books. And that's something we got to keep a real eye on because, again, Prince William has, and the entire area has really suffered through the same bottlenecks for mm -hmm. so long. And it's time to get the priority back here and, and focus on it to make sure we don't lose actually revenue in the net gain, so I, oh, I think I it's, you know, it's positive. You, you can't lock yourself into a box. I think that's your point of either raising taxes or lowering. I think if you were to go into business and say, I'm never going to raise capital, you'd right. go out of business quick, wouldn't sure. you? Sure. But yeah, as a business person, you have to make the decisions. Sure. And I think businesses and governments the same way. You have to be able to raise capital and also reduce expenditures when you need to. Um, so it, it does work both ways, but mm -hmm. hopefully you see the value in what you're buying. And that's that's where I think we've lost a lot in our, well, in our I process. I think that's a great attitude, and I think that's going to take you a long way. So I'm going to thank you one more time for joining us tonight. I appreciate Absolutely. it very much. Thank Best you, of luck to you. Appreciate it. Thank you, viewers, for joining us, and I'll see you again next week right back here at Knights of the Roundtable.